what's up you guys marty schwartz here with marty music and i had the recent pleasure of uh getting together uh obviously through video with my buddy michael palmazano from guitar gate you should check out his channel it's really awesome i have a link below for sure uh, he does a lot of reaction videos and so we were talking about doing some kind of collab and uh, we started thinking about checking out those masterclass videos. And so what you're about to see are some great highlights from us uh, reacting for the first time to the Tom Morello masterclass. Uh, if you're a fan of Tom Morello, I think it's a really inspiring uh, a course to check out. Um, you know, we give our thoughts and uh, you know, just a, a, little, a little taste, but definitely check it out if you're a fan of Tom Morello. And uh, without further ado, Michael Palmazano. Let's check it out. Michael, what's up? Dude, what's happening, man? Good to see you again, brother. You too. So we both teach online and we sell courses. And um, I was always so curious when I saw these master classes come out, you know, with Morello and Santana. And I'm just like, what are the dudes at this stature, what do they choose, you know, for their 16 lessons or whatever it is? Because I think with these master class courses, it's like less than 20 lessons. So I'm like, what in the world would they choose? So I, I'm excited to go through it with you and um, see what see what it's all about. Me too. Now I haven't, uh, I've obviously, I haven't watched these courses, although I've always been curious. Yeah, I've seen we the trailers. All, we can all learn from everywhere, right? I feel yeah. like we could probably learn from anybody. These are a little bit more of a vanity related thing. Right, it's yeah. very high end. Yeah. They're rock I mean, stars as well, which I find that rock stars, at least in the past, uh, aren't huge on like beginner teaching. None that I know of. <laughs> no, I mean, and rightfully I mean, so. I, I understand that. Yeah, I mean, you know as well as I know that it's very rare to find someone who's that good, but then can also communicate what they do. They seem to be like. It, you know, mutually exclusive skill sets. Um, yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see, you know, what they have in here. I, I've seen the trailers for both because I've been served ads over and over and over and over again. <laughs> All right. Well, let's take a look at. Uh, let, let's look at this lesson list. Let's see how many they are. And, and, and uh, okay. So Marty, first lesson right there. You know, get ready to uncover your authentic artistic self. Uh, riffs, gear. Tones and Tom's noise chart. Can we can we check out Tom's noise chart? <laughs> Wait a minute. That's One not of the guitar. ways that I've organized the different guitar noises that I've come up with through the years is by keeping a noise chart, something very similar to what you see here, uh, and. Always had that at rehearsal. Always had that at home. So when I came up with a new noise, I would write down. All right. Look at this, look at this noise chart. Teeth above the nut, you know, bagpipes, turn tuning peg, air raid siren to start song. <laughs> so he's saying he's, he, he goes into the studio and when he's thinking about what, what sounds could go on, 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 a, on, on a tune, he literally has this chart where everything like unique, I guess, he's come up with over the years he just he just has it and he and he he picks from it. Yeah, yeah. This reminds me of a kung fu master, with <laughs> with their their developed techniques and styles that they've developed over the especially above the nut height. Yeah, I mean it's like it's like there's a move there's a move for everything. Ooh, guitar jack maneuver, scritchy scratch. Okay, I think I know some of these. Let's play it and see if he shows it. Shows one or two. <laughs> swirling echo triplets. So with that, I have a long delay set at kind of a lengthy setting. And then it's just a matter of playing triplets on one or more strings. So yeah, I mean that's that's kind of what that's kind of what I expected, you know, it to be uh, really about the effect and the sound. But even though it did say it includes tabs in there and there is a workbook to download, he really doesn't explain what a triplet is or what notes he's playing or anything 
uh, harmony wise uh, about it. It's really just he's just going to go through step by step and talk about each one of those noises and not actually what his fingers are doing. Yeah, and I and I what I was thinking earlier, which is kind of confirming it, is when you're like a rock star, celebrity, famous musician, you're not. You just, I don't know, I've never really seen a lot of rock stars sit down and actually break down a, a simple lick or something. It's more like, let's celebrate my world and my catalog and my <laughs> bag of tricks. My awesomeness. It's more, let's celebrate my, yeah, my awesomeness. And and I think he is awesome, so I'm not he, I'm not dissing, I'm just... It's more observation. Uh, All right, let's let's um, let's go back to the lesson pages. Why don't you pick something that uh, catches your eye? Let's go to, let's let's just check out riffs, you know? Yeah. That's totally. actually, honestly, I like all the effects and stuff. It's very creative. I don't think any of that means anything if you don't write monster riffs that people re relate to and remember. And, and that band, that band was full of monster riffs and that, me taking this class, what I'd really want is to know is his thought process on coming up with that stuff, you know, more than the actual sound. So yeah, let's give this let's give this a play. If we had had other instruments, we would have written other music that sounded good on those instruments. Yeah. And so that is one of the things that's always led me in my guitar playing is if you pick up an electric guitar or a bass or an acoustic guitar, it leads your riff writing in different directions. And that's something to embrace. Let's try one in F sharp, which is one of the most rocking of all keys. Agreed. And let's see what we got here. <laughs> Let's stick to the key of F sharp and see where the tone of, uh, of an acoustic guitar leads us just off the cuff. he says about different instruments having you know coaxing different things out of you completely true i mean i'm i know this is true like for you because we've all had this experience you get some new guitar or like he says something happens and you get a, a different amplifier you immediately play stuff that you otherwise wouldn't i mean it's it's 100 true i mean i know that there's some really famous songwriters out there that have said oh yeah that that guitar brought me that song. You know, I picked it up and that's the song that came out and I wouldn't have that song if it wasn't for that guitar. That's a real thing. All right, well let's 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 keep going. Um let's let's scroll down there and uh let's look at some of the bottom half of of these lessons here. All right. Go back to number 7 there. Uh, let's see. Influences, classical and folk, but then the next one EDM, blues and hip hop. All right, I, so he does go into beginner theory and unlocking the fretboard and improvisation. Um, I'm curious about number nine, about how he structures his practice time, how he recommends yeah. people to, to, he says, balancing technique and theory. Let's see how he sets his day up. Yeah. Let's talk now about practice and process. You practice technique to get your fingers to go where you want them to go. You practice theory to understand where they can go and why. You play live and you write songs, you practice that to bring the theory and the technique and create art with it. And then you seek inspiration to make that art something that's meaningful to you and that can communicate to others. Yeah, that, that, that's, <laughs> that's a great intro for this. Yeah, that's uh, uh, you know really as close to how I would describe it. Yeah as possible. Each one of those aspects he talks about can can help you. And if you can put them all together, then that becomes you. But the ultimate goal is uh, emotional content moving you yeah. in some emotional way with through the music. But the technique exactly is to be able 
to have the ability to then create the music. The theory is just like he said, the why and, and how, which will help you. Um, I think one of the greatest things is uh, it, using his approach is that, you know, yeah, you've practiced for years, you've learned other people's songs, you've got a bag of things, and then you throw it all out the window and you, you know, and you just start improvising and kind of uh, lo looking for that inspiration, like he's saying. Yeah. But then, let's say you come up with one of those monster riffs, then and you're like, oh, I've got this monster riff. Maybe you don't even know the theory at first because it's just came from inspiration and technique and it comes out. Then you can sit there and go, what was it that I was doing? Oh, okay, I was, okay, yeah, that was like a D pentatonic thing. So my theory tells me that, you know, I could go and do like a G minor change or here are the chords that could relate or I could, you know, modulate to this or um, if this is these two chords equal this, you know, mode or key, that means that these other chords are gonna sound great. So now let me search for some more inspiration knowing that on where to go from here. But ultimately it's still all about the inspiration. Yeah, and, and I I couldn't agree more. We'll leave it at that. Let's let's keep playing it. <laughs> Literally zero natural ability on the guitar. It, I had to fight for every single inch of my guitar playing. Later on, there were breakthroughs where creati creativity came easy, where I was able to move my fingers around the fretboard. But I promise you, and hear these words, I had zero natural ability. It was only through hours and hours and hours of practice that I was able to amass some sort of ability on the guitar. Practice is really is something that I absolutely have sworn by my entire life to uh, become a better musician and a more fulfilled artist. That's that's a really important thing to hammer home. I, I really appreciate, especially for the beginners that are watching this or beginner intermediate, how much he's, you know, he's taking almost two minutes to to go in to describe just how important practice is and how he wouldn't be able to do what he's doing without committing to practice. So just just that on a motivational, inspirational level, just saying multiple times, I had no natural talent. I had to fight for every little bit of it. Letting people know that he's not a magician, that you know anyone can do this if they just commit to doing it and realize that it's a long-term goal, and you're not going to have short-term uh, gains, you know. And you're and along the process, like he said, you're going to have you're going to have hard times where you feel like you're stuck, and times where you make breakthroughs, and they're huge. But this is, you know, you're talking about developing habits, which you do over your life, you know, because this is a, like a lifetime goal. I just really appreciate him him making it that clear to people watching. Something I would throw in about him in particular and what he was just saying there is that, you know, don't underestimate the power of someone that's super creative and artistic as opposed to technical ability on the guitar. I mean, really, you can tell that he's a super intelligent guy yeah. and very creative. Very, I mean, look at the guitar itself, right? Dude, he right. had to make it his own, right? Yeah, and and totally. I know all the political stuff is a huge part of him as well. But what I'm saying is, I think the point he's making is that he had um, a voice inside that yeah. needed to get out, and the technique was just like the the journey he had to take along the way to already get to that kind of creative soul. That he, yeah, that he to get it out. Let's play more of that practice thing, and then we'll talk a little about it. Building blocks to practice are practicing every day, playing with other people, mm -hmm. and playing live. Uh, I received some tremendous advice when I was a beginning guitar player. A friend of mine in high school said, practice an hour a day. He said, if you're serious about wanting to play guitar, practice an hour a day, every day, without fail. And I took those words as gospel. And I began practicing an hour a day, every day, without fail. And I found over a very short period of time that like a slow rising tide, I'm like, oh, after a couple of weeks, my playing was noticeably better. Rather than, you know, jamming four hours on the weekend with friends and then playing again in two weeks and then practicing one night for a half hour, I made a commitment to practicing every day. And it was, and I felt like I started playing late. I started playing when I was 17 years old. So I was felt that I was tremendously behind, but in practicing every day, that one hour, 
you can really get better when you practice an hour a day. What happens if you practice two? And then I saw my playing grow exponentially. Yeah. And what if it's four? And what if it's six? And eventually it was eight hours a day, every day, without fail. And the without fail part was very important um, to me and the commitment to the instrument. Sometimes I'd be, like I'd be at college and I'd have a, uh, in college I was around the four hour a day, four hour a day mark. I'd have an exam the next morning. I'd have a fever of 101. I'd finish studying at 1 a.m. and I would play till 5 a.m., not 4.58 a.m. Mm -hmm. Every day without fail. And for me, it was that commitment. One, I, I loved the, 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 the idea of the, <laughs> this Spartan routine of committing to this guitar. And I know that it's only up to me what I can do with it if I practice hard enough and practice consistently enough. Yeah. I mean, I love so many things about it. A again, I just love that he's spending a whole lesson. I mean, he still hasn't shown a practice routine. This is all motivational stuff. But that whole, the two things stand out to me in there. One is the commitment to live playing. You know, he, you know, those three pillars he's talking about with practice, you know, one is actually playing live with the band. And you know this. Now, not everybody has the same goals. You know, they might want to record. They might just want to, you know, play acoustic with their friends around a bonfire or do whatever. But like he said, for people that want to get seriously good, you can only get so good by yourself. There's something that happens with other people uh, on stage with an audience where it is a completely different skill set and animal. So I completely agree with that. And number two is, you know, he's saying, I'm not stopping at 458. It's about developing habits and a routine. And I think you'll agree that anybody that is successful in any endeavor in life uh, builds habits around the goals that they're trying to achieve. And those, those habits are daily, they're specific, and they're immovable, you know, barring some emergency. Uh, and so that's what, that's what he's talking about. And I always tell my students too, I'm sure you do the same, that just like learning anything in life, repetition is the most important thing not so much duration. So while he's saying an hour a day or two hours a day, even if you, even if you subdivide that hour into uh, three 15-minute segments, if you, the more times that you actually pick the thing up, right, put it down, pick it up, building those habits of just consistently keeping it in your hands, you do get better exponentially faster. I told, I love this whole lesson. For the uh, super beginners out there that get super overwhelmed because it's so difficult or, or seems so foreign in the beginning, um, I I would always say, I said it in my, my master classes, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> not done to the same production value, but uh, anyway. The production's amazing. I, I would joke around, I mean, in, it was, a, I'm sneak. I was sneaky with my advice because I would say five minutes a day is all it takes. But what I'm really doing by saying five minutes a day is making it seem um, uh, unintimidating and right. also creating the habit of picking up your guitar every day. So I would say five minutes because the hope is that as you get through that first little beginner hump, all of a sudden you are playing for an hour, but in your mind you picked it up because you're like, oh, five minutes a day is all I had to promise myself. And that's very, very low entry fee, you know, to get into this. But when you have those little breakthroughs, hopefully that that five minutes um, does become an hour or two hours or four hours, the more progress you make. Another thing he was saying that I relate to is I started playing my senior year of high school is when I really got like mm -hmm. addicted to it. So I relate to that. I never said, okay, I'm gonna practice for one hour exactly. I was just so addicted to playing guitar that I never timed myself. I was just playing as much as I could play because I just dug it. So I'm sure it right. was multiple hours a day, multiple hours a day for years, but I never was one to like set the timer or to say, okay, it's time, but you know, I didn't have that kind of routine. It was just like, I was thinking about guitar, listening to music, playing music, 
Um, but I mean, different people learn different ways. The other thing I wanted to talk about with what he said, and it's an analogy I've used a lot because I really know that I improved the fastest. My, my biggest growth of improvement on guitar was a long time ago, over 20 years ago. I mean, I still work on things, but when I was like really exploding with my playing, it was because I was in college and I had two or three buddies that were better than me at guitar and yeah. we would jam all the time and I would mm -hmm. have to try and keep up with them. So it mm -hmm. pushes you even farther. And a great analogy that I would always use, or at least it's what it re it's how I related to it because I, I had experienced it before, is like skiing. Um, most people snowboard now, but, uh, but skiing, if you go out skiing and you're skiing with someone that's better than you, they're in front of you, they're going faster than you, they're, you're, you're like pushing yourself to the limit of almost crashing to keep up with someone that's better than you, and it's forcing you to improve quicker. And you do, you improve quicker. So if you're, I mean, there's nothing like being on stage going like, oh, I gotta be able to play through this, you know, yeah. 12 Bar Blues or Tom Petty song, and people are watching, the other band members are relying on me. Nothing will speed up your improvement than that. And I used to say, especially with emails and questions I get about learning guitar, because that's what you and I do, right. I, would always, I would always say try and play with someone just a little bit better than you. If you play with someone too much better than you, then it's just discouraging. You want to like do the throw the guitar <laughs> off a bridge thing. But if you got someone that can just play a solo just a little better or play that rhythm just a little better and you try and keep up with them, is the fastest way. To improve. That is it in a nutshell. It's it's totally true. And I, and I would agree with a lot of those things, just getting out of your comfort zone, you know, getting with people better than you. I mean, nobody improves really at anything without being pushed a little bit and feeling a little uncomfortable, building those habits of trying to get better, of, you know, being okay with failing and failing, but then breaking through and failing and failing and then breaking through. That is, that's an analogy for life. I, I felt that big time when I was in GIT. And um, I just, uh, I love that we're even talking about this. Yeah. It's, it's it, every, everybody that wants to learn an instrument, is, it's so true. And like you said before, not everybody needs to do the five hours and have it regimented. Uh, some people, like yourself, you're just so in love with it, you're going to keep it in your hands that much anyway. But... People like me, I'm a list guy. I like to start my day with a list. I start at the top and I get to the bottom, I cross things off. You know, everybody does it differently, but it all comes down to the habit of trying to get better, you know, and, and however that works for you. I just, I, I love that this is a key component of his course. All right, Marty, so I picked practice. Why don't you pick one? Let's go to improvisation. Love it. Improvisation should be fearless. There are never any points off for making any mistake. So whether you're jamming along with a song, you know, at your computer on a record player or playing with other musicians, I would just say that that is should be it's, you know, it's like free time at recess improvisation. You know, there are other times where in your studio and the, the clock is running and a mic's on your amp where you've got to get it right. Improvisation is not one of those times. It should uh -huh. really be a time that should just be fun to experiment with new things, to try things that are artistically unsafe uh, and uh, and without a net because uh, there's nothing at stake other than you growing as an artist and as a guitar player. I love his whole vibe, man. I've always loved his whole vibe. That, 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 the whole idea of just, you know, there's a time for practice, there's a time for being serious, there's a time to be safe, like if you're recording, but just that improvising is none of those things and don't expect it to be any of those things, to do it fearlessly. I, I, just, I love his whole vibe, man, always have. I agree. Uh, I haven't disagreed with anything that we've looked at, um, I think the impro impro improvising is probably what I do the most, you know? Because totally. it, it's almost like a form of meditation, you know, free form, getting stuff out. Some people, I mean, you know this, you have, you know, a million students or whatever. Uh, some people really, really want to have tabs for everything. They want to learn everything specifically and really struggle with improvising. You and I, I feel, come from the opposite school, which is improvising is kind of what comes naturally. It's, you know, at least for me, at least, 
the buckling down and learning something note for note, you know, reading it off the page, what I had to do in school, that was pulling teeth. And yeah. I was endless I was endlessly amazed because I really got to see it on display at GIT. Um, at the amount of people who, you know, like myself, who were natural improvisers, but struggled greatly, you know, with, you know, getting a piece exactly right for a performance, you know, reading even simple melodies. And then the other side where you have these people who've been reading um, since they're five or six years old, and they can play through these incredible pieces um, and make little sheet music come alive. But then you put them in an, in an improv scenario where it's just, you know, these are your changes, go for it, see what the band does. And they literally lock up. It's totally different mindsets. We all have our own strengths and weaknesses. and Totally. And there's something about being a really good improviser, being on one end of the spectrum as opposed to like a classical violinist who can, you know, read through... Uh, you know, a whole score and play it beautifully with emotional feeling and, and content. Um, but yeah, I, I, I agree. I tend to not listen back too carefully to my improv uh, stuff unless there's a, a moment or a spark where I go like that was the one. I'll give you, I'll give you a, a, a distinct example. On the Atlas Underground record, Gary Clark Jr. Uh, came over to my house and we jammed. We did nothing but improv for hours with the tape with the tape player rolling. We yeah. rocked. We he sang, I sang. We threw lyrics back and forth. We stood there, you know, uh, cut heads on the guitar, sh uh, playing blues licks and shredding licks at one another, and that was free form, pure improvisation. Then Gary went away. I listened to the stuff picked out juicy bits of our guitar playing, juicy bits of the lyrics and his inc his incredible vocals. And we forged a song on the Atlas Underground record called Where It's At Ain't What It Is that doesn't resemble the blues jam that we originally were were on, but it was the it provided the seeds for a really great, powerful song that came out later. So that's certainly one of the benefits of jamming is to listen back to it, find the golden nuggets within an improvisation, uh, and to make songs out of them or store them uh, later for your own soloing. I I think so many so many great um, uh, writers, guitar players, musicians, whatever are committed to recording themselves jamming. Like I know that um, like Dimebag always had a tape thing with him. And he said, you know, that the majority of Pantera riffs that he came up with, he was just re-listening to himself jamming and picking out what he says, like juicy bits. I also heard, I don't know if you, if you know this, you probably do. Um, David Lee Roth said that, um, Eddie Van Halen used to do something similar where he would he would take leads over the songs that they were doing, but he would do it long form. Like he would riff for like an hour over these different songs that we all know and love. And what he would do is he would find, re-listen, find parts that were awesome and then relearn what he did and copy and paste. Like, you know how we do it in Pro Tools now, where it's just like, okay, I like that part, that part, and put it together? Well, he would do that long form and then relearn the solo and then record that as one take. Um, so that that whole, what he's talking about, that commitment to just, you know, being fearless and, and getting it out there, but then re-listening and finding out, okay, that was trash, that was trash, that was trash, that's a gold nugget, you know, that's trash, whatever. Doing that, so many people swear by that process. It, it clearly works. There's something magical, you know, in that moment of inspiration when you're improvising and it's like, is it playing you? Or are you playing it? And there's a magic in there. And when you listen back, you can feel that magic again. So it makes sense that when you find those, those little magical moments that you can, yeah take that feeling that was kind of a happy accident and push down that path. So I think all the best songs were probably written that way to some degree. All right, huge shout out and thank you to my friend, Michael Palmazano. Be sure to check out his channel, you guys. I uh, got links below for it. 
and uh, hopefully you'll see more of us doing stuff again in the future. Let me know in the comments what you'd like to see. And also thank you for subscribing here to the channel and you know, all that stuff. So hope to see you again. Take care.